Our next speaker is Rachel Kakmar from the University of Colorado, and she's going to be talking on postural puncture headache. All right, hello again, everybody. Um, so my last talk of the day is postural puncture headaches, and I still have no financial disclosures, but since it is my last talk, I'm going to take the liberty of flavoring it with a little bit of Colorado ski propaganda. <laughs> um, hope over the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'll give you a refresher on some of the epidemiologic principles of postural puncture headache, get to the who, what, when, how of why these things occur, and then delve into some of the things that we can do to try to either prevent the occurrence or severity of these headaches, or when they occur, how we can best treat them. To demonstrate how common this issue is, I'm going to run through a quick math problem. In 2012, there were about 4 million births in the United States. If we see about a 60% rate of women receiving some sort of neuraxial procedure and assume about a 1% risk for postural puncture headache for all comers, whether they receive a spinal, a combined spinal epidural, or an epidural, this leads to about 20,000 women or more suffering from a postural puncture headache in the United States alone. Not every one of these postural puncture headaches can be traced back to a gush of CSF through a two-way needle or some other large bore needle. But the theory behind these headaches really results to the egress of CSF from the interthecal space that leads to a situation of intracranial hypotension. When there's hypotension within the brain, the brain itself sags, creating tension on the pain-sensitive areas such as the meningeal tissue. This type of intracranial hypotension also allows both arterial and venous vasodilation, leading to cerebral hyperemia. Cerebral hyperemia in the bridging vessels as well as within the brain itself also contributes to the development and severity of headache symptoms. Risk factors for postural puncture headache can be split into procedural side of things and patient factors. And not surprisingly, most of the procedural impact comes from the needle characteristics themselves. Gauge of the needle may be the most important. Not surprisingly, the larger the gauge of the needle, the bigger the hole that occurs in the dura, the more CSF that leaks, and the increased risk for headache. An easy way to make a comparison is to look at a 27 gauge pencil point spinal needle that has about a half percent risk of headache compared to a 17 gauge two-way needle, which carries more of a 50 to 70 percent risk of a postural puncture headache when an unintentional dural puncture occurs. Other aspects like using a cutting tip needle instead of a pencil point needle or aligning the bevel of the needle in a perpendicular manner to the uh, meningeal fibers can also contribute. As Dr. Sen mentioned, a CSE technique, while it may seem counterintuitive, may actually decrease the risk for postural puncture headache as practitioners can use this small gauge needle as a way to get positional feedback while they're trying to place an epidural and may prevent the phenomenon of going too far with the two-way needle and causing that large bore unintentional dural puncture. When it comes to what type of loss of resistance is better, air versus saline, well, the evidence shows that there's really not a big difference between the two, especially in experienced hands. And the best way to prevent unintentional dural puncture and the development of postural puncture headache is to use your preferred technique. The use of air is associated with pneumocephalus headaches, however, so if that is chosen, we should be cognizant to not inject um, very much, if any, air into that epidural space. The patient factors can be really well represented by the woman in this ski poster, a young, thin woman of childbearing age. Um, patients with a history of postural puncture headache or those that undergo a second stage of labor with extensive pushing may also be at risk. The theory behind why pushing may um, influence the development of postural puncture headache goes along with the thought that increased number or duration of Valsalva maneuvers may increase the size of that dural hole and thus allow more CSF to leak out. We know that morbidly obese patients are at higher risk of difficult epidural placement and unintentional dural puncture compared to the non-obese population. But it, when it comes to the influence of BMI on the actual development of postural puncture headaches, the um, jury is still out. Early evidence seemed to indicate that there was a mild protective effect. This was probably, or at least theorized, to be due to increased uh, volume of the epidural venous plexus in those patients as well as increased epidural fat deposition, 
with the thought that that increased volume would help to equalize the pressures between the intrathecal and epidural space and, in theory, decrease loss of CSF from the intrathecal space. In 2014, a retrospective study was published that calls that a little bit into question, as these authors found that there was no difference in the incidence of postural puncture headache, the severity of headache once it developed, or the need for an epidural blood patch um, when comparing the morbidly obese to the non-obese population. A second large retrospective study was published the following year that again aligns a little bit more with that early evidence that I spoke about. These authors found that there was a decreased incidence of postural puncture headaches in, B in patients with an elevated BMI. However, they also found no difference in the need for an epidural blood patch when comparing the two groups. So I think when it comes to obesity, we still don't have a definitive answer on how that influences postural puncture headache and epidural blood patch. To back up a little bit, I want to discuss how this de um, phenomenon is defined, and this comes from the International Headache Society. They updated their definition in 2013, and they state that postural puncture headaches should occur within five days of vitreal puncture, and that the positional nature should be very apparent from the start. They further describe that these headaches should occur within seconds of a patient assuming a seated or upright position, and should resolve within about a minute of laying supine. They stress that you should try to find out if the headache was positional at the onset of symptoms, because as time passes, that um, nature may become less apparent or a little bit more subtle. And within their definition, they include the, um, the idea that this should be a self-limiting uh, self condition and symptoms should resolve in about 14 days. So clearly, a positional headache is the hallmark of a postural puncture headache. Typically, in 90% of patients, we would see this type of symptoms within the first 72 hours, and most patients complain of a frontal, dull type of headache. However, many also complain of an occipital headache and associated neck or um, shoulder stiffness or pain. About 50% of patients have associated nausea, vomiting, or photophobia, and in cases with significant intracranial hypotension, there may also be a component of cranial nerve stretch leading to symptoms like decreased hearing, tinnitus, or double vision. Unfortunately, a, health, a headache that's developed within the first three days postpartum is very, very common and may occur in about a third of women. The most common etiologies for this are the same as in the non-pregnant population. Things like stress, tension, caffeine withdrawal, migraine headache syndromes. We do have a few more concerning um, items in our differential, things like postpartum preeclampsia, in intracranial hemorrhage or thrombosis that need to be considered. Despite some of those scary options, um, in considering that the diagnosis of postural puncture headache is largely based on patient risk factors and clinical history and presentation, imaging or invasive testing is really rarely necessary. If you do feel like imaging is needed either to rule out some sort of other pathology or in a case of atypical symptoms, then MRI is the modality of choice. With an uh, MRI in a patient with a postural puncture headache, pachymeningeal uh, enhancement is seen, decreased volume of the subarachnoid cisterns and the cerebral ventricles, as well as that prototypical downward displacement of the brain indicating intracranial hypotension. We may also see some subdural fluid or blood collections, um, which I'll talk about in a second. So women get headaches. Why is this such a big deal? Well, these headaches can be quite debilitating. If you can imagine a woman going home postpartum that's unable to complete her activities of daily living, able to walk, even able to sit up long enough to breastfeed her baby or take care of the newborn. One survey found that of, of patients with postural puncture headaches, up to 40% experienced at least a week of impaired activities. And all of this can lead to either increased hospitalization, increased utilization of healthcare, and increased cost for a patient and health system. In addition, I mentioned that blood or fluid collection. Acutely, we can see actually subdural hemorrhage or subdural hematomas. Similar to how you get cerebral vasodilation when you get intracranial hypotension, those bridging veins can actually get enough traction that they tear and lead to a, a subdural hematoma. And this is not an insignificant thing. It can have a, be associated with a mortality of about 10%. And unfortunately, many times the symptoms will overlap with those of a traditional postural puncture headache. 
The cranial nerve symptoms that I mentioned, if not treated in a timely manner, can become permanent. And chronic headaches are an increasing um, source of investigation. As one study showed, that we may have up to about a 30% risk for chronic headache development in patients who suffer a postural puncture headache. And as Dr. Rowland showed that nice graph from the closed claims analysis, headaches can lead to legal action against obstetric anesthesiologists, certainly not an insignificant number. So I hope I've shown that postural puncture headaches can be painful not only for the patient but for providers as well. So I want to get into some of the things that we can do to try to mitigate these headaches or take care of them when they do occur. I'm sure that all of you, and, and I have as well, have recommended conservative measures to patients. These are pretty simple things, bed rest, trying to stay supine, drinking a lot of fluids or supplementing fluids through the IV. Unfortunately, the evidence is not great that these do anything to decrease um, occurrence, severity, or really improve outcome in any way for postural puncture headache. So we're really left with pharmacologic and invasive options. And I, again, unfortunately don't have time to go through all of these, but I want to talk about a couple um, for the next few minutes. The first of these are the methylxanthine derivatives. I think caffeine is probably the most widely used. And the theory behind um, why caffeine may be helpful is that they can act potentially as an adenosine receptor inhibitor and cause a cerebral vasoconstriction, basically counteracting that cerebral vasodilation that may contribute to headache symptoms. Typical dose is around 300 to 500 milligrams PO or IV. It can be given one to two times daily. However, we probably only get a temporary improvement in symptoms from this and really see no difference in the need for epidural blood patch. Adrenocorticosteroid hormone, or ACTH, has also been proposed as a mechanism to prevent postural puncture headache after unintentional dural puncture. Cosentropin is an ACTH analog, and it was studied in a dose of one milligram given IV following delivery in patients who had an unintentional dural puncture. Mechanism action for why this might work is, again, largely unknown, but it may have something to do with an increase in aldosterone production and an increase in CSF. The authors of this study found that cosentropin decreased not only the incidence of postural puncture headache, but also the need for the epidural blood patch following that. This study should be taken somewhat with a grain of salt because although cosentropin or ACTH is a relatively benign substance, it's obviously an intrinsic hormone, um, there's only been one study on this, and it was a single author study. So while it may be a reasonable thing to try, I think we need more evidence before we should be incorporating it widely into our practice. Many things have been attempted via the neuraxis to try to deal with postural puncture headaches. The first of these is saline. Studies have been done on injections of saline either through the TUI needle at time of the accidental dural puncture or through an interthecal catheter that was left in place. The reason that we have tried this sort of thing is that if we can replenish the CSF volume, we may be able to slow or eliminate that intracranial hypotension and de decrease symptomatology. Unfortunately, there's nothing to keep the saline in place once um, either the catheter or the TUI is removed, and it really does nothing to reverse the actual issue with CSF leakage. So we likely only see a temporary delay in symptoms when this type of therapy is utilized. Epidural morphine has also been used um, to try to pre prevent postural puncture headache. There's one study looking at injection of three milligrams of morphine, and these authors found a significant decrease in the incidence of postural puncture headache from around 50% to a little over 10%. Unfortunately, again, this is not something that has been replicated with multiple studies, so I think it's, again, too early to say if this should be incorporated into practice. And finally, intrathecal catheter. This is by far the, the um, therapy that has been utilized the most in this type of patient population. And it likely has a multifactorial um, reason behind, behind working or helping out in these patients. The first thing is that placing an intrathecal catheter through a large dural hole acts as a dam. It decreases the egress of CSF, and hopefully, when left in place for a number of hours, helps allow the body to replenish the CSF volume decreasing the amount of intracranial hypotension that occurs and decreasing that downward movement or sagging of the brain. The original meta-analysis um, behind this also posited that perhaps inflammation occurs by having a foreign body in place. And while that seems like a wonderful theory, the actual inflammation 
um, would need about 19 to 21 days to occur. In addition, we have hopefully medically inert catheters that shouldn't be causing inflammation. So it's unclear if that actually has a role in helping with the prevention of postural puncture headaches. One thing that intrathecal catheter placement does do is it avoids a second attempt at an epidural. So you avoid a, the possibility of having a second unintentional dural puncture and certainly increasing the risk for postural puncture headache in those patients. When it comes to how long you're going to leave the um, catheter in place, we can do it for up to 24 hours. Um, we have seen that a meta-analysis shows good evidence that this doesn't decrease the incidence of postural puncture headache, but can decrease the need for epidural blood patch. However, you have to really feel out what the comfort level is at your institution and with your providers, nursing included, for having that type of catheter left in place. It is a direct line into the CSF and CNS. And if the risk for injection of something that's undesirable is higher than the potential benefit, it's probably not a good idea to move along those lines. All right, so we've finally reached the epidural blood patch. I'm sure you've all been waiting for it. Um, this really remains the treatment of choice for moderate to severe postural puncture headache, especially when there's any sort of cranial nerve involvement. The mechanism behind why this works is, again, multifactorial. First of which being that when you initially inject blood, you probably get a small epidural hematoma that helps to decrease the pressure gradient between the intrathecal and the epidural space, again, along the lines of decreasing the rate of flow from the CSF, um, from the intrathecal space of CSF. Over time, that clot will mature, and hopefully that will allow time for the dural rent to heal on its own. About 70% of patients who receive an epidural blood patch have good relief after the first procedure. And even those patients who don't have complete relief should see some initial improvement. For patients who continue to have a positional headache even after one epidural blood patch, it is reasonable to discuss performing a second epidural blood patch. How we do the procedure may impact how successful it is. We have good MRI evidence that blood moves preferentially in a cephalad manner compared to a caudad. So it may be good practice to try your epidural blood patch at a level below where the initial unintentional dural puncture occurred. Discussing risks with patients should include the, all the risks of the original epidural, as well as warning patients that they may experience lower back or hip pressure following the injection of the blood. When it comes to timing, this remains an area of active research and controversy. We really have three groups. The prophylactic group, where blood is either injected into the catheter or uh, before headache symptoms occur. The early group, which is within 24 hours of headache onset, or the late group after 24 hours. I'm gonna to get to prophylactic blood patch in just a second, but I wanna address the early group. So there are a few issues with performing an quote unquote early epidural blood patch. The first of which is that there may be a substance within the epidural space that interferes with how we would normally expect that blood to act. You may have residual local anesthetic if you were not able or willing to place an, an intrathecal catheter, and that local anesthetic can dilute the blood that is injected. If you have a lot of CSF that's leaking into the epidural space, you can also get that dilution, but the CSF may actually interfere with the clotting process itself and you may not be able to get that secondary mature clot formation that we're all looking for in those cases. Um, early blood patches could be considered, again, for the most severe headaches and if you are seeing the cranial nerve symptoms. Again, we wanna treat cranial nerve symptoms in a very timely manner to prevent anything from becoming permanent. Early studies suggested that performing an epidural blood patch may decrease the incidence of postural puncture and the need for a, a second therapeutic, in, decrease the incidence of postural puncture headache and need for a secondary epidural blood patch. There was a large study in 2004 that calls this into question. As these authors found that while there was a decreased severity of postural puncture headache, performing a prophylactic epidural blood patch really had no impact on the incidence of postural puncture headache or for patients needing a secondary therapeutic epidural blood patch. As I mentioned, this continues to be an area where there's a lot of research. And in 2014, a group came out that did show um, a significant decrease in the incidence of postural puncture headache in the group that got a uh, prophylactic epidural blood patch. This was quite significant from about 80% down to about less than 20. An, epidur or an editorial was published alongside this study 
that brings to light some important differences between the groups and really emphasizes that because we don't have a good body of evidence, we need more quality perspective studies to look at specific patient populations that might benefit from prophylactic epidural blood patch and how that should look, injected through the catheter via new um, de novo epidural prior to development of symptoms, what the ideal volume of blood might be. I think I forgot to mention the ideal volume of blood in the therapeutic blood patch is about 20 mLs. This was based on a dose-finding multi-institutional study that compared 15, 20, and 30, and 20 was really the best balance of um, good results with lower risk of that low back pain and pressure and complications. So I'm going to spend the last couple minutes talking about some new potential therapies that um, have been proposed that probably have pretty weak evidence but are somewhat interesting to discuss. So the first of these is on Dancitron. On Dancitron is something that we give a to a lot of our patients, especially those undergoing a cesarean delivery. And this group looked at using ondansetron to decrease the rate of posterior puncture headaches in patients who received a, a um, spinal with a quinky needle. This is a cutting edge needle, and it carries a baseline risk of headache of about 25%. So while they saw a pretty significant decrease in the patients that received saline to those that received ondansetron, that nearly 5% risk for posterior puncture headache is still well above what we would expect using a 25 gauge pencil point needle that I think most of us use in our common practice. In addition, the dose of ondansetron, if you assume about an 80 kilogram patient population, which is what these authors had, works out to about 12 milligrams. And this is much higher than the four or even eight milligrams we might consider giving our patients. So I think while this is interesting, it's not exactly applicable to our current practice. It will be interesting to see if we follow this up with other studies on uh, in patients who receive postural puncture headaches following a um, uh, spinal needle or pencil point needle dural puncture or those that receive an unintentional dural puncture with a large bore needle. Epidural starch has also been proposed in case series and case reports. And while this is certainly an off-label use and these um, authors required special permission to use it, it may be a potential alternative when epidural blood patch is really not a good idea, specifically in those patients with a blood cancer like lymphoma or leukemia, where injecting autologous blood within the central nervous system is probably not good practice. Finally, occipital nerve blocks. These sort of blocks have been used for a number of years with very good success in the chronic pain um, uh, arena, especially for things like migraine headache syndromes or, or cervical headaches. And this is a pretty low risk procedure. There have been a number of studies looking at occipital nerve blocks in regards to postural puncture headaches, and they have seen decreased severity in headache symptoms, improvement in BAS pain scores. However, these have been compared only to conservative measures. There's never been any sort of comparison to epidural blood patch. And the reason for that is that these may be more useful in patients who, again, cannot receive an epidural blood patch or who refuse it. Again, looking at the Jehovah's Witness patients, some of those may not be willing to receive an epidural blood patch. Again, I think this is a very reasonable thing to consider. Um, and if you're not comfortable, you could certainly refer patients to the chronic pain clinic because it does have such a strong track record in, in headache syndromes, and it is a relatively low-risk procedure. So I hope I've, I've shown you that postural puncture headaches really can be a significant um, problem for postpartum women. They can be incapacitating and make a significant impact on the ability of women to care for their newborn. If possible, we should try to anticipate and avoid risk factors the primary of which is probably an unintentional dural puncture with a large bore needle. However, this, all, this occurs not infrequently, you know, a rate of one to 2% overall. And when it does, we should try to do whatever we can to prevent this incidence and severity of postural puncture headaches and to be aggressive with treatment when headaches do occur. Epidural blood patch remains the mainstay of the definitive treatment. Um, and we can consider creating a kind of protocolized treatment. This protocol off to the side was based on surveying SOAP members a couple of years ago. And your individual protocols, if you develop them, will largely depend on what's available at your hospital and what providers are comfortable with. But it helps align some of the goals with getting that timely treatment in order to take care of these patients. And 
with many things in obstetric anesthesia, this remains an area of active research. We will need to stay tuned to see if we can better define specific patient populations that may benefit from certain prophylactic or therapeutic options. In the end, we're all trying to work our way down the ski hill with success and not the alternative. And I think that we have a lot of good ways that we can, can treat these women and their headaches. Um, since this is my last talk, I want to say thanks to Dr. Geyser for the invitation to speak, and I hope we, all, we see you out in the Rocky Mountains very soon. Thanks.